Once a month, we'll be featuring a new case, whether it's an unsolved murder or a missing person who vanished years ago. These are the real stories behind these cases and the emotional toll they've taken, not only on law enforcement who are still searching for answers, but the families at the heart of these stories, desperate for any clue to bring them peace. Tonight, we start with the murder of Cleo Burdett 16 years ago in Sissonville. I hope I can get to look them in the eye. And ask them why they did it. Why they did it, yes. I want to know why. An answer to a simple question that Gwen Wines never got to hear. I'll never get over this. There'll never be an answer for it. She died last year, 15 years living in fear, never knowing who killed her brother Cleo Burdett and why. It traumatized her. Loretta Shirky says her uncle, who most people call Junior, was a master of his trade, a well-known farmer, never married and no children, who lived here at the family's home place on Cicerone Road in Sissonville since he was born. That was his life. Loretta painfully remembers that day on August 13th, 2004, that forever changed her family, the day her aunt Gwen found her brother dead on the floor of his own home. Gwen and I used to talk. And it was a constant. <laughs> on her mind. She couldn't understand why, why they couldn't make an arrest, why they couldn't uh, do something that was conclusive. Burdett had been tied up, beaten, and forced to drink weed killer. The phone lines cut and the gas left running. I guess hoping a spark would set the house on fire, and then nobody would find anything. But who would want to torture and murder a 77-year-old man who was deeply adored by those around him, and why? It appeared to us that somebody had really ransacked the house, went through everything. There were kind of, it looked to us like they were looking for something. He had gone to market the day before and sold a bunch of cattle, and they were pretty sure that somebody must have been at the market, seen him with all the cash, knew he lived alone, knew his house was isolated, and he would be an easy target. The questions still mount on Loretta's mind. So does the frustration for detectives who had little to go on. Some individuals in the area that live there or, and went to church in the area, they came forward and said they had spotted what appeared to be, they thought was a reddish colored Toyota that had been parked near Mr. Burdett's house. But if it was cash the killer or killers were looking for, it wasn't there. I don't think that they thought that he had a chance to go to the bank, but I guess he immediately went to the bank the next morning, put the money in the bank, and he never carried a lot of money with him. Investigators remain hopeful. Even after 16 long years of unanswered questions, this case could be solved. We still get information on it frequently, and we follow it up until that lead's exhausted. For Loretta and her family, it's a matter of dignity and justice. If you can beat, torture, someone, kill them, in that manner, you should be human enough just to come forward. A plea to anyone listening. And if you're not the person or persons who did it, then if you know something, you should do it. To bring them peace. I mean, the family, they deserve it after all these years. 
Detectives tell me they have had suspects in the case. Some have been cleared, but there are others they are still looking at. They are asking anyone who may have any information to call them 304-357-0169. We have uploaded much more information and background on this case, including raw video and interviews. You can find all of that on our website, WCHSTV.com, under our new cold case files tab. Reporting in the studio, Leslie Rubin, Eyewitness News. This month marks a decade since an Eastern Kanawha County man was last seen alive. And while investigators do have suspects in mind, they don't have the evidence needed to secure an arrest. Eyewitness News reporter Leslie Rubin continues our investigations into local cold cases that, with your help, could find answers for desperate family members. Ten years have come and gone for the family of Samuel Riser, who everyone called Dicky. By all accounts, he was a well-liked, happy man who investigators don't think would have left on his own. But what happened to him? Who would have wanted him dead? And why can't police find his body? There's been no updates. It's at a dead end. Five years ago. It hurts. It hurts. Linda Barnett remained determined to find out what happened to her brother. Somebody's going to talk. Linda has since passed away, but the family's fight to find out what happened to Samuel Riser, who everyone called Dickie, continues. And my kids were just getting to know him, and now, you know, they never will. To this day, we do not know where Mr. Riser's body is. The mystery of Riser's disappearance in the winter of 2010 continues to haunt investigators. Everything that we feel um, led to his disappearance may have occurred either late on December the 8th or December the 9th. Detectives have kept many details of the investigation guarded, but we do know that Riser's co-workers at a coal mine were the first to realize something was very wrong. They happened to realize he hadn't been at work for three days, so they in turn got a hold of his uh, landlord. His landlord went to the residence and uh, they had a key to the house and went inside the house and found that uh, the TV was on in the house and some lights were on in the house, which was, they say, very odd for Mr. Riser. Inside the home, detectives discover blood. There was enough blood in the house to indicate there had been some kind of maybe, uh, maybe an altercation in the house. Nothing was stolen. There was even a large amount of cash still inside. Everything in the house intact. His car still sat outside, but there was no sign of Riser. We think it was personal. Um, we think the crime happened um, we think uh, Samuel Riser knew the person that came into the house and possibly even left with them. Over the years, detectives say they've developed suspects but haven't had enough evidence to secure an arrest. Leads have been exhausted. They've got numerous leads on locations of where Mr. Riser could possibly be. Um, they've got maps. They've conducted searches in those areas with uh, cadaver dogs. Um, there's been abandoned mines they've went to. They've searched those areas. Um, they've searched um, areas where water's located. They've searched those areas with canines. Riser's family has pleaded for information on where his body could be found. We want the people to know that we have feelings. Our family is suffering and we just want our brother's remains back. As detectives plead for that one phone call that could finally bring the answers they need. It's got to be very frustrating for them not to know what's happened to them. Um, it's frustrating for us not to know. We'd like to be able to give them answers. Notorious criminals in West Virginia were officially charged today in connection with the murder of a witness in a 1989 murder case with ties to the infamous Moundsville prison riot of 1986. Eyewitness News reporter Leslie Rubin has to look back at their violent past and what finally cracked the case 31 years later. This occurred on the 14th day of March, 1989. More than three decades after John Perry was beaten and strangled with a t-shirt inside this cell at the old Harrison County Jail, the three men investigators believe are at the center of the murder are facing a judge after Harrison County detectives say they recently gave lengthy confessions. Frederick Hamilton and brothers Warren and Charles Franklin were all part of a group of a dozen inmates that had been brought to the jail to testify in Charles Red 
Snyder's murder trial. Snyder was accused of stabbing an inmate 18 times during an infamous New Year's Day riot at the Moundsville State Penitentiary in 1986, where a dozen guards were taken hostage by inmates demanding better conditions from then-Governor Arch Moore. They want uh, better food, more food, more hot food. Detectives now say Perry, who was the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood gang at Moundsville and had also been recently acquitted of killing a rival gang member, was ordered to be killed in the midst of an ongoing power struggle in the prison. They slapped each other on the back. They shook hands. They, they made little jokes. We didn't have any idea that somebody was going to end up being killed. Hamilton is accused of standing as a lookout after he had coached Perry into the cell while the other inmates beat him unconscious. Hamilton also accused of wrapping a t-shirt as tight as he could around Perry's neck. Hamilton has been in prison since he was a teenager. He killed a West Virginia trooper in 1977. Right now I don't have any privilege of communicating with the outside world. In 1992, Hamilton was one of three inmates who tunneled their way out of the state penitentiary. He's attempted escape more than a dozen times and has previously vowed to do it again. Fighting to get it, get those people caught and get them back into prison where they belong. The Franklins, once dubbed the Panhandle Bandits, have also escaped prison. Captured after a shootout with police and kidnapping six people, they were also later convicted of killing an inmate during the 86 riot. In Clarksburg, Leslie Rubin, Eyewitness News.